I want to welcome the newest member to our subcommittee, Senator Murphy. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It is uh, an honor to join this uh, prestigious subcommittee and uh, grateful for the opportunity. Thank you all for being here today. Um, I'm uh, really grateful for the chairman, the ranking members focus on the suicide epidemic and for all the work that you've put into it. Um, I wanted to talk to you, uh, Rear Admiral, about a very specific case that um, I've become um, intimately and tragically familiar with, and that's the death of seven sailors on the USS George Washington just last year. One of them was a Connecticut resident, um, seaman recruit uh, Xavier Sander took his own life with a service-issued firearm. Um, and, you know, by now you know that the conditions on this ship and the conditions for these sailors was, you know, frankly just unacceptable. This was a, obviously a ship that was going through a major refueling and complex overhaul. The conditions on board required a lot of these young men to be sleeping in their cars, um, uh, to be making long trips home, to get away from the chaotic scene, and the access to mental health was just completely inadequate. Sailors who were seeking routine care um, on a ship that had significant conditions affecting mental health um, were facing waits of up to two months uh, for care. Um, members of um, uh, uh, Seaman Recruit uh, Sanders Division reported that they were often hesitant to seek mental health treatment through Navy channels because they were under the impression that it would affect their future career opportunities. Um, obviously, this is exceptional that we had so many individuals take their life in a short period of time, and I know that there is still a final investigation that is uh, outstanding, but what can you tell me today about how we are changing conditions for um, our seamen who are living under these kind of conditions and how we're making sure that they have access to mental health services? Uh, thank you, Senator Murphy. Um, from, from the Secretary of Navy on down, uh, we have taken this issue very seriously as we have taken the general issue of uh, mental health and suicide prevention seriously. Uh, I can tell you that um, our immediate response was to, con was to send a special uh, psychiatric response team uh, that, was to, that was to counsel those uh, who were directly affected by these incidents, uh, these tragic incidents. Uh, we've learned also that it's important not only to respond acutely, but to have a prolonged response. And so uh, all of the members of the George Washington are, are uh, enrolled in what's called Orion, which is a periodic check-in uh, to assess how they're doing and ask if they need help. Uh, historically, when we've done this on five previous occasions, we have about a 20% take rate and we directly do a warm handoff for those individuals. But the larger issue, sir, is, is ensuring that we're creating a resilient force. Uh, GW certainly is an example of a, a challenging situation to be in a shipyard like that. But our sailors and Marines face challenging situations worldwide, and so developing force resilience is key. Uh, toward that end, all of our recruits now go through warrior toughness training. They learn s stress reduction techniques. Uh, as well as meditation. Uh, these are reinforced uh, through their training. Um, in addition, um, for the GW and for the Greater Navy, uh, we, have an, we have an expanded operational stress control program. This is a train-the-train -train model. Um, uh, in addition as well, our Office of uh, Navy Culture and Force Resiliency just rolled out a mental health playbook, which provides tools for unit-level leaders and beyond uh, ways to prevent suicide, ways to recognize an individual in distress. All right, thank you very much. I'll look forward to follow up with you on that. I just want to sneak in one more question, and that's to you, Mr. Assistant Secretary. Um, we talked a lot about this independent review committee report. Um, one of their urgent recommendations was to address um, Section 1057 of the 2011 NDAA, which prohibits the Secretary of Defense from collecting any information regarding firearm ownership uh, by active duty members. Now, I think this was due to some concerns about overreach, but I don't think that the drafters of that language contemplated uh, the fact that it is just good medical practice if someone is in crisis to inquire as to whether they have a firearm at home, whether that is, firearm is properly stored um, and locked. And so I'm not gonna ask you for your view on the law, um, that's a question for us, but as a rule, is it good medical practice 
for there to be gag orders on physicians as to what questions they can ask their patients, um, what information they can try to solicit from their patients? As a physician, you know, the, the relationship between my patient and I is kind of sacred. I mean, because we, we, we talk, and I, I expect him to be truthful to me so I can help him. So anything that interferes with that interferes with good medical care. So that my position is that. I mean, anything that interferes with a good open discussion between the patient and the physician or a provider, not necessarily a physician, uh, is not good for either of the two parties. I, I, if I don't know, I cannot help you. And if you cannot tell me, even worse. So uh, I, we need your help uh, to facilitate that process. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr.